Elevation Nation for episode 117. I should start it out by saying we are, because we got a Penn State alum in the house, Brandon Lyons. Welcome to Elevation Nation. We are so excited that you are here to share your story about resiliency, who you are, your background, and more importantly, show people how they can get through each and every day with their own internal battles that they're going through. I think you obviously exude resiliency and a lot of Elevation Nation is trying to figure out how they can be more resilient in their everyday lives. So we could not have picked a more perfect guest to join us. Brandon, welcome to Elevation Nation. Yeah, Sam Parker, thanks for having me. You know, a, a friend of Mike is a friend of mine. So um, I was was recommended to you guys by Mike Perkson. And then, you know, also to have some some fellow EY colleagues, um, you know, happy to happy to hop on the podcast with you guys. I've been texting Sam for a while about this podcast. I feel like we met a while ago. I'm like, damn, when are we going to have this episode with Brandon? Um, you know, I guess you're a Penn State guy. We're Terps, so we can give you a little crap back and forth. But we are super, super excited for this conversation. Um, so I guess we'll just start it off, Brandon. You know, it's Elevation Nation. Elevation Nation podcast. Let's start with an elevator pitch. Who are you? Where do you come from? What are you up to? Um, tell Elevation Nation more about you. Yeah, good question. You know, as, as you mentioned, so uh, graduated from Penn State in 2012 with a bachelor's in science and supply chain. Um, and then for the last, gosh, 10 years now have been uh, in the professional services industry, working with EY, uh, kind of have worn a, a few different hats uh, at EY. Started as an intern back in 2011 um, in our IT risk and assurance practice and then moved on to a, a stint as a supply chain consultant uh, within our consulting practice for a few years before then transitioning uh, to what my current role is now uh, within our experience management center of excellence. So moving to the internal side of the business, working closely with you know, finance, um, you know, talent, workforce management, uh, and providing a lot of analytical solutions uh, to our consulting leaders. So have been in that realm for uh, the last you know, six years now. Um, and I've really started to, you know, find a footing in my career. And then on in parallel, you know, outside of EY, um, I'm a member of our Team USA Paralympic cycling team, uh, training up for the Paris 2024 Paralympic Games. Elevation Asian, you can't see. He is wearing, I can't see what the shirt says, but I see an American I see flag. some Olympic rings on there. I see some Olympic rings. It's a pretty cool collared shirt. What, what does it say, Brandon? Yeah, so I had done a stint uh, out at the Colorado Springs Olympic Training Center. It's the the largest of three uh, Olympic training centers that we have in the United States. And I lived there since 2017, up until 2020, actually, uh, until the pandemic happened. So uh, one of the shirts is being a tour guide and, you know, giving, um, you know, individuals different opportunities to come and, and check out, you know, how Olympians and Paralympians are made um, as, you know, my stint there at the uh, at the training center. I'm excited to get more into that, Brandon. I think that's obviously an incredible sneak peek into the life of an Olympic athlete that most of us only dream about. I know I thought maybe I'd play for Team USA on the basketball team, and then I stopped growing at 5'8", so uh, that was a no for me. But uh, I'm excited to get into that. A little bit more about your background as well is you, I believe, played club lacrosse at Penn State, right? So athletics has kind of always been a part of your life. Did you have a similar kind of boyhood dream like myself of being a, you know, lacrosse or basketball player? Because I know Parker still thinks he's going to make the MLB. He still thinks he's going to have his baseball dreams succeed. I believe in you, Parker. Maybe one day. Why can't I just become a marathon runner, Sam? I you can. Gone you can, past the baseball. You're over baseball now? All right. I love it. So what about you, Brandon? <laughs> Did you have a, a childhood kind of athletic dream as well? I did. You know, I mean, I, I think like any, you know, young boy growing up, they just aspired to the people that they saw on TV. Right. So like, you know, watching Michael Jordan early on and then LeBron James was, you know, our, our next athlete within my generation. Um, so just aspiring to a lot of that and then being a, a multi-sport athlete, gosh, I mean, since since elementary school, right, playing basketball, lacrosse, baseball, soccer, I mean, trying everything out until you know, really finding something that I was, you know, passionate about and really started to love. And, you know, through high school playing lacrosse and football and basketball. And then as as you mentioned, then transitioning to focusing on on one sport and, and playing club lacrosse at Penn State for a few years. 
but yeah, I mean, my, my aspiration, I think always as a kid was, you know, I wanted to be a professional athlete and, you know, how could I get there? Right. So unfortunately not seeing that then come to fruition and, you know, l- lacrosse being a, a unique sport and at the time, a you know, up and coming sport, it wasn't, you know, large in the U S it was really a, a Northeastern, um, type sport. So we had a little bit in Pennsylvania, but I didn't start, you know, until middle school going into high school. And then there wasn't really opportunity for, you know, after college athletics was on lacrosse or, you know, folks that are still playing professional lacrosse, they have, you know, a, a professional career as well. They're trying to balance both. So, you know, when I got to college, it was the whole focus was, okay, the professional sports Avenue is not going to happen. So (laughs) what's the next best thing. And, you know, my, my family being in the business world and just knowing that, okay, I went to school to get a job and not only to land a job, but to land a career mm. that I was going to be able to, you know, be financially independent. Um, and that was my main priority. So landing at Penn state, um, you know, the next option was, okay, how was I going to be able to, you know, check off that goal? And it was, you know, declaring for the right major at the right time. And supply chain was really coming into, you know, everyone's topic. It was kind of the hot topic at the time. And when I was there, uh, when I started uh, college, um, you know, we had our, our supply chain degree was the number one in the country. Wow. So it was, an, it was an easy decision for me to, you know, go down that path and was, you know, fortunate enough to land a, a few great internships and then, you know, turn it into a career DY. And we got to give, I don't know what episode it is, Mike, I'm sorry. We'll have to look up your episode number after this, but Mike Perks, and if you're trying to learn Elevation Nation, a little bit more about landing a job, internships, the power of networking. We had a killer episode with Mike. Let me see if I can find it. I think it's 63. I could it, be wrong. Yeah, okay. I think well, we'll see. You'll find it. Fantastic episode that I think Brandon, you know, learned a lot from Mike, as did Parker and myself, about just how to be professional and, and land that job and really put your degree to good use. So I think that's important. I think Parker and I also had that realization that sports kind of ended, but Brandon, then kind of sports resurged in your life as of, I mean, a little bit late for most people, right? You know, we played it in high school and we had all that stuff, but it took a little bit of a pause and was more of a passion. And now sure is still a passion, but a little bit more serious. If you got the Olympic emblem on your chest, can you tell us about how you kind of stumbled into the Paralympic team a bit? Sure. You know, it's, it, I would say sports, I didn't find sports again. Sports found me. Right. And it, it was really coming from a crazy experience that happened in my life. So as I mentioned, I'd started at Ernst and Young as an intern in 2011, came back full time in 2012. And it started my career uh, right down in the greater Washington DC area. Um, you know, thanks to Mike Perks and he was the one that hired me to the firm. And, you know, was was so excited about landing this opportunity to to start my career at EY. You know, as I mentioned, you know that was my next goal was to you know find a a firm that was going to be able to support me and provide financial independence and you know really an area for growth and development. And you know EY just spoke to all of those things that I was searching for in an employer. So when I started my career in 2012, um, you know I, I thought my career was going in one direction, and you know things were starting to, you know, succeed and and really excel in really everything that I'd hoped for, right? So I, I'd started in our supply chain degree, uh, in, in our uh, supply chain consulting practice. And, you know, within that first year was awarded the supply chain rookie of the year within our entire consulting firm. So um, a, a great recognition for, you know, all the hard work that I was doing. I was, you know, really starting to network with a lot of folks and starting to make a name for myself as an, you know, early graduate, you know, coming, coming out of college into this firm that had, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that was this massive global firm. So, um, you know, it can be very scary starting a, starting a job and not only starting a career at a, at a large firm that's, that's, you know, has this such global presence. So, you know, seeing that recognition early on, you know, really just fueled that fire that I wanted to continue to succeed and, you know, try to be the best person that I could be at work. Um, so fast forward then just a year and a half, it was May 2014. Uh, I was down at the beach on Memorial Day weekend with some friends and some coworkers celebrating a friend's birthday. Uh, and I mistakenly dove into shallow water, broke my back at the T5, T6 vertebrae area. So, you know, if you could just imagine yourself being 24 years old, you know, really your second life just starting, right? You had gone through college and now this is your you know, you're out of the nest. This is now you're financially mm-hmm. independent. You're having a great social life. 
um, you know, a lot of, you know, positives in your life. And then for all that to come to a, you know, screeching halt, really only at the age of 24. Right. And I can just remember being in that water, um, you know, looking up to my friends and telling them that I couldn't move. I couldn't walk. Wow. Um, I needed help being pulled out of the water. So I'm six foot three. Um, the water was about three foot deep. So there I am just sitting on the ground. And, you know, I think at that time, my friends looking into the water, just saying, you know, get up, you're joking. Right. Just just not even coming to grasp or, or really wanting to accept that it happened. And I remember just instilling them, no, really, I need you to pull me out of the water. I can't feel anything, can't stand, completely motionless, you know, stuck at the bottom of this water. And there I was being pulled out of the water, um, then was airlifted from Ocean City, Maryland to was was to be uh, the shock trauma center in Baltimore, Maryland, to have immediate surgery. And un unfortunately, uh, the helicopter that was there to to transport me for immediate surgery didn't have enough gas to get to Baltimore, Maryland to, to have the immediate surgery. So we had to then pull off um, at a smaller hospital, refuel, check all of your vitals. And I tell everyone when I'm going through this story that, you know, when I'm in the helicopter, all of it still to me in my head, you know, just felt like, okay, this was just another injury, you know, something serious happened, but you can't really come to grasp of, you know, the, the severity of, you know, what you're experiencing. Never been in something this serious before in my entire life. I uh, didn't know anyone that would had any, you know, traumatic experience like this, but it, it started to really become real as, you know, I was in the helicopter and I could hear the dispatcher on the phone with my mom um, telling them that they needed to get to the shock trauma center. Uh, you know, Brandon was in a serious injury. He's going to, you know, have to be rushed in for immediate surgery. And that was, you know, when I could hear them wanting to not accept, again, very similar to my friends, not accept the situation that I was in. Um, and then me telling my mom, no, I'm paralyzed. Right. And it was like at that blink of an eye, wow. you know, whenever I heard, you know, my mom and my parents in the background, that's whenever we had that decision of, oh my gosh, okay, this actually is very serious. Um, and again, I think to my to my parents' sense that, you know, th since they weren't there, they didn't want to accept it. You know, being an only child, they didn't want, you know, th that to be the case. They were trying to, I think, comfort me and just reassure me that everything was going to be okay from afar. Um, but then because of that refueling process, you know, the next thing I remember is, you know, waking up, being surrounded by family, friends, coworkers like Mike Perkson, all around side in a hospital bed. And then again, just reassuring, okay, something extremely serious happened. Um, you know, just imagine being surrounded by everyone that you love and loves you in a hospital setting. I mean, it's something that you don't wish on anyone. Just can't even imagine. I mean, it's, I, I mean, I just got the chills while you're walking through that story. And I mean, it's just a young adult. I can't imagine how difficult that was to wake up and, you're in this new reality and that's what it is. That's where you, that's life. So what, what was your new reality like as you woke up from surgery um, and you wanted to carry on with your life? What was that like that, you know, those next few weeks, months ahead? Yeah. You know, it, it was those early stages of, okay, you know, now coming to acceptance of, you know, what had happened but I, I think it was it was still so challenging just not being familiar with this experience, right? I'd never had a sit I'd never been in a situation that was like this my entire life growing up, nor known anyone similar to this, right? And as I was in the hospital, you're you're immediately surrounded by all of these positive stories of, you know, there's this person that had a very similar situation. They overcame it. They were back up walking everything, right? And you're just hearing all of these stories. So you're almost reinstilling in your head that, okay, this is going to be you. So from the very beginning, I never had that that mindset of, okay, I'm never going to be able to walk again, right? It was just, okay, if, if X did it, then why can't I, right? I know how hard of a worker I was my entire life. I know how dedicated I was, determined I was that, okay, this is just going to be the next challenge. So that was my mindset from the very beginning when I woke up from that you know, medically induced coma early on, just of, you know, go, going through the, um, you know, the, di the different, you know, pharmaceuticals that I was on and coming out of the surgery, it was okay, you know, how am I going to be able to, you know, recover and really just gain that sense of normalcy back again, 
Um, so I was in the hospital for about two weeks um, within our uh, s surgical hospital, just going through you know, battling stints of pneumonia and really just letting my body truly recover from the traumatic impact that it had, right? So when they went in and did the surgery, they fused my spine uh, with eight, uh, eight screws and two metal rods between the T5 and T6 vertebrae. So right in your middle, essentially you had two rods that were there, you know, acting acting as my spine to be able to hold me up. Um, and, you know, from, from there for two weeks, then was transported uh, to an inpatient hospital where I spent the next month. And it was really all about gaining independence again and, you know, trying to get you out of the hospital back into the real world. And again, just being so early on, it was like, okay, like how quickly can I get out of this place? But it was more important. Yeah, I'm going to walk again. I'm going to be able to regain everything that I wanted to again. And I'll always remember this pivotal moment that happens, you know, in my life and really, I think, dictated how I, you know, tried to attack this recovery was the first time that the doctor came in when I was in the inpatient hospital, looked at myself, looked at my parents all in the room and just said, okay, here's the diagnosis. You know, Brandon, you have a 1% chance that you're ever going to walk again. And I remember just looking, you know, at the faces of my parents and then just being, you know, shocked and, you know, being, being down that, oh my gosh, he's 24 years old. What are we going to do? We're going to take care of him. You know, he's not going to be able to, to, you know, accomplish and really just, you know, live that life that he was living before. And it's, and it, it's funny, you know, you don't know how you're going to react until you're in a situation like that. But I remember looking at the doctor and saying, well, you, you didn't give me a 0% chance, right? You still gave <laughs> me a chance that I was going to be able to come out of this 100% regain my mobility, regain everything that I wanted to accomplish, you know, leading up to this. So um, I think that helped with, you know, reassure to my parents, you know, put it into their head that, you know, I'm going to figure out a way. Um, so it was, you know, having that mindset, having that perspective early on to, you know, continue to push forward, you know, with this life. And I'll, I'll never forget as well, you know, that, that second pivotal moment, I had so many pivotal moments early on that, you know, truly, you know, framed how I was going to overcome this, whether I was going to walk again, or, you know, just whether I was going to be able to, you know, continue living. Yeah, I, I think, I think that was more important than anything was I was down in this recreational therapy room. So we had just, you know, everyone that was, you know, dealing with some type of traumatic injury, you know, you're surrounded by, gosh, you know, hundreds of people that, you know, you can relate to. Right, they're dealing with some sort of traumatic injury, some sort of life-altering event, and you're all in there to try to get better. And I remember seeing a girl that was relatively, you know, young. She was in her 20s, similar to my age, and she was in a uh, she was in a uh, electric wheelchair. So she was getting around by a sip and puff straw. So if someone doesn't know what it is, there's a little straw that's in your mouth, and you essentially blow air on it to to actually maneuver the wheelchair because she had no function in her arms, no function in her hands, anything like that. So she had broken her neck. And I remember whenever she asked me what had happened to me, I told her that I dove into shallow water, um, you know, broke my back at the T5, T6 area. And she, I could just see it in her eyes that as she, tarted, as she started to tell me her story that she too dove into shallow water, but broke her neck, that, you know, I, I could see it just looking to me and saying, gosh, why couldn't that be in me? Right. Like, why couldn't I have just broken my back and still had full control of my arms? Right. I was able to live an independent life when I was in the hospital, still able to get around without any help. And here was this girl that, you know, just wanted a little bit more. And to me, that was the biggest pivotal moment in my life to date when I, I truly understood, you know, the power of perspective. Right. And, and that was the way that I was going to, you know, continue to live my life with no regrets. Right. I can't take back, you know, what had happened have to continue to push forward and, and truly, you know, become grateful for what I do have. And I think that's a challenge, right? A lot of people go through, you know, these hard times and it's when you're willing to accept what had happened is then you, you almost become unstuck, right? And you're, you're able to move forward. And if I didn't have that pivotal moment, I honestly don't know if I'd be sitting here talking to you guys here today. It's hard to even know where to begin in responding to that brand. And I think one thing I want to highlight quickly is my mom, who is a big supporter of the Elevation Nation podcast. I'm named after my grandfather, who 
broke his neck and was paralyzed from the neck down and got around in, in a chair similar to that. So I know your story and that girl's story and hearing this and how inspiring you are and your perspective on life. You know, she lived through it. I unfortunately didn't get to meet him. Um, but I know that your story is inspiring her and, and thank you for opening up and sharing that with Parker and myself. I think, you know, everyone's going through a very weird time right now with COVID, right? And I know no one's been through really anything like this before. And a lot of people are feeling really down and bad about themselves and people are getting new jobs and moving around and doing new things and trying to find themselves. And, and a lot of people are feeling lost. And I think one thing I want to highlight that you said is, you know, you learned a lot about perspective. And one thing that Parker and I like to preach a lot is the power of that perspective. And it's not easy to figure out. Sometimes it takes a, you know, shaking moment of meeting someone who inspires you or hearing a story like yours, Brandon, to really wake you and shake you and allow you to really use perspective to your advantage. But a challenge I want to put out there to Elevation Nation is listen to Brandon's story, how inspiring he is. And, and we'll talk about resiliency too here in a bit, Brandon, but let's all take a minute to try to use perspective to our advantage and to help us. I think a lot of times social media, unfortunately, um, you know, it almost encourages perspective to hurt us a bit. I think obviously it can be used in, in great ways, but for, you know, our generation growing up on social media, I think a lot of people um, have perspective and compare themselves to other people in a negative way. But I think if all of us can kind of use perspective and flip it on its, on its head and use it in a powerful, positive way, we really unlock a new part of ourselves that we've never even seen or, or used before. So again, thank you for opening up and sharing that story. It's truly incredible. And you again are exuding perspective and resiliency as well. I second all of that. And I want to talk a little bit more about that pivotal moment and what came next. You know, you had that perspective, you saw that perspective and you had to be self-aware enough to take in that perspective and understand it for yourself. At some point you were like, I'm moving forward. I'm going, I'm going to live my life. Could you talk through what that was like and how you began to truly elevate yourself in this new reality? Yeah, sure. And I, I think you hit it on the head there, right? So it's like, you, you're understanding the situation that you're in, and then you come up with this, you know, you, you have this growth mindset, right, where you get this perspective, and you have this like, aha moment, right? It's like the light bulb comes down and, okay, this is the way that I should live my life. This is the way that I need to have this, you know, outlook, whenever you're dealing with some type of adversity, or just really, really any type of challenge that you, you know, come to a crossroads with, but then it's willing to accept it. And then okay, once you accept it, you know, what's next, right? Like what's the end goal and how are you going to get there, right? And when I had this moment, again, to your point was, okay, now it's time for, you know, Brandon to continue to live his life, right? Still to be able to go back to being able to accomplish everything that I had set, you know, prior to this injury happen, right? So it was like rewinding back and saying, okay, how am I going to be able to accomplish these things? And I remember, so I was then discharged out of the hospital. So I spent uh, about a month within our inpatient unit. And then I was, you know, deemed well enough, strong enough to, you know, come back into society. And unfortunately, at that time, I was 24. And I, you know, moved back into my, moved back into my parents' house. So again, another challenge of being 24 yep. years old. Now I feel like I'm going backwards <laughs> instead of forward. Right. And again, that was that next moment. It's like, okay, this is not the way it's supposed to happen. This is not the way that I drew it up. How am I going to be able to continue to push forward and, you know, move on? And, you know, it really was just setting these goals. And really the first way that I was able to do that, I, I owe so much to sport that we, that we talk about, you know, sport found me is I was introduced to this hand cycle. And for people that don't know what a hand cycle is, it's a recumbent bike that someone with mobility issues, you know, would use, they lay down, they have a one wheel on the front, which is the drive wheel. And then you pedal the, pedal the bike with your arms instead of your legs. And, you know, I, I received this bike as, 
you know, a gift through a fundraiser from family and friends and coworkers as a way just to get active again, right? As I you know, talked about before, sport was was so important to me. And, you know, right before my injury, I was, you know, becoming an endurance athlete. So I loved running, loved being in the gym and had signed up to, you know, run my first marathon um, in October of 2014. And then the injury happened, unfortunately. And I remember that first time I had the hand cycle out, you know, it was, it was so impossible just to get it out of the driveway, right? Using these muscles that I had never used that way before, right? Using your arms to push at that time, I was 195 pounds, you know, out of the driveway on this bike. Um, and I was like, okay, this is extremely, this is extremely hard, but knew that I didn't want to give up. Yeah. You know, I wanted to give it another chance. Um, just knowing that, you know, I had so many people be invested, you know, in this, in this piece of equipment. And I remember the second time I took it out, I went to this little Island outside of Harrisburg called city Island. And I did 20 miles around this one mile track. And I, I remember, you know, wh when that, when that event finished, um, you know, just, you know, having that realization to go, okay, I just did 20 miles the second time that I did this. Why not go after that marathon goal that I want to do accomplish? And so I remember going home, not telling my parents, not telling my friends, but I contacted the marathon organization and I told them my story, told them my situation, uh, understood that they had this hand cycle division, um, and, and asked if I could switch my registration over. And they were willing to accept, they, you know, loved the story. And there I was in October of 2014, you know, just five months after being laid up in a hospital bed with pneumonia and a broken back, unable to move there at my first marathon, you know, and then 26.2 miles later crossing that marathon yet on a flat tire, yet on <laughs> zero hours of sleep because Penn State uh, went to double overtime against Ohio State. The oh my before. gosh. Um, but there with, with an actual, um, you know, bucket list sign that my parents created that I was there able to, you know, check it off. Right. So and that, that was that realization that, okay, re regardless of the situation I'm in, I'm going to figure out a way to, to pivot and, and still be able to, you know, accomplish any goal that I'd set. Yes. It's going to look different, but there's still a way that I'm going to be able to do it. And it was that time that, you know, I didn't allow others or really didn't allow myself to place any limits on what I was capable of. I can't imagine that feeling getting across the finish line. I mean, I'm sure it's one thing receiving a medal and completing your first marathon, but just everything that had transpired. I mean, oh my gosh, I probably like, like I, I'm just getting the chills. Like it's just, that's an incredible, incredible thing. Um, Sam, do you want to jump in? I know you yeah. have a question. So I, I do have a question. One of my questions that I have for you, Brandon, is you now have one of the first things you said was you accepted your reality, right? And you said, I'm going to keep living my life. Looking at how your life has transpired now, how many of your issues or challenges that you're facing are related to your injury and how many of them are just normal, you know, young male adults figuring out life challenges that all of us are kind of going through now? Has it kind of shifted as your reality has become more accepted and ingrained in who you are? Yeah, you know, I think that's a great question, right? I think, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of preface it going back to what you mentioned on social media, right? So it's, you know, everyone sees, you know, the glitz and the glamour, right? No one wants to post, you know, the the bad things that everyone's going through. So I, I, I see a lot of people that, you know, and, and and honestly, I'm guilty of it myself, right? It's putting out a brand and putting out, um, you know, something that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to stand behind. Um, and, and people may look at my life, you know, being, you know, after this situation for seven years and go like, Oh, yeah, you know, they don't even really maybe even see that I'm in a wheelchair anymore because of all the, you know, success or experiences or opportunities that I've had. Um, but, you know, I, I still have those those challenges you know, each and every day that that's just never going to go away. But I've been able to, I, I think, cope with it easier. Um, again, accepting, you know, my reality early on and just finding a way and accepting that, OK, this is my new normal. You know, it, it's just something that I, I don't have the time or energy to put into, you know, waste or feel bad for myself. I'd rather just move forward, you know, with with life. So 
Um, and, and then just, you know, outside of that, yeah, sh- sure. I mean, everyone has those experiences of being, a, you know, in your 20s, early 30s, um, you know, trying to navigate, navigate your career, navigate, mm-hmm. you know, relationships, you know, you name it, all of that. That's, I think that's almost more of it. Um, just because I've almost become, I don't want to say numb, but just, you know, accustomed to some of the, the day-to-day challenges that I deal with just from, you know, being in a wheelchair and having my situation. So you're wearing the American flag on your chest. We have to now, like, how was the story? How did you go from just doing a marathon to now becoming an Olympic training athlete brandon gets a gift from friends and turns it into an olympic career that's i was just like where did whatever they gave you they could have given you any sort of uh any sort of tool you would have turned it into some sort of olympic career i bet yeah you know it's it's honestly so funny like i mentioned i didn't get to the story but you know of you know sport finding me right so you know my, my parents and my friends and my family you know had that fundraiser and had this bike and you know, when I did that first marathon, I, I wasn't aware of the Paralympics, right? Yeah, I think I've, I've heard of it, but wasn't wasn't accustomed to it, didn't know what it truly was, didn't know there was an opportunity for elite athletics and, and really just competition, mm. right? Again, after being injured. Um, and it was when I was, was introduced to the bike, you know, I had done a few marathons here and there, but it, it was more just recreational at that time of just getting out and being active again. And, you know, early on in 2015, so it was about a year after I was injured, I relocated out to San Diego, California. Um, And while I was out in San Diego, I was going through a stem cell clinical trial and didn't bring my bike with me. Um, You know, at this time, this was the first opportunity. Okay, I can get out of get out of my parents' house. Right. Come back and, you know, gain full independence again. Um, So I, I had relocated out to San Diego and was out there, you know, going through the stem cell clinical trial, working for EY full time, um, still, you know, rehabilitating and, you know, trying to gain as much you know, recovery as I could. And I remember coming back on Thanksgiving and, you know, I had gone through this, you know, rehabilitation program for, gosh, it was coming up on almost a year. And unfortunately at that time, uh, the, the rehab program that I was going through, wasn't covered by insurance. Uh, I was living in San Diego, so essentially all the money I was making as a you know, 25-year-old was going directly from Ernst & Young's pocket into you know medical bills, hmm. right? And and just to be able to live in San Diego for you know just the cost of living. So um, I remember coming around close to a year and you know having that conversation with myself of saying, you know, I'm not I'm not seeing the improvement that you know I had hoped for. You know, I worked my ass off for the last year. And didn't see anything of it, you know. Is, is is it really worth it? Is it really, you know, d- does it make sense to continue on, um, you know, this path that I'm going down, or you know, a- am I losing out on an opportunity, you know, to truly live, mm. right? I, I'm losing out on a lot because I was just fully invested. I was only working and only rehabbing. Was doing nothing else. And I was out in San Diego and I saw these, you know, beautiful roads along the beach and these, these bike paths and bike lanes. And, you know, it just, it just spoke to me of, you know, just a, a way to get active again. And I remember coming back my, my first Thanksgiving away and, you know, telling my parents, I'm going to bring the bike out with me. And, and again, I remember that conversation of, of them looking at me and saying, how are you going to get the bike out there by yourself? We're not there. How are you going to get in and out, transport it in your car? You know, you're, you're in a wheelchair. And I remember not having the answers at that time. I had never, you know, done this by myself. But I remember just looking to them and saying, "I'm, I'm, I'm going to find a way." I found a way. Everything else I've done, again, things are different, but you know, it, it's still possible to be able to achieve anything you want. So, it was again wanting to prove to not only my parents but really prove to myself that, okay, every single thing that might sound scary right? Might seem, I don't have an answer to, I'm still going to dive completely in and go for it. And it was something that I needed to do at that time. So um, early on, I brought the bike out to San Diego and it was my first ride out there alone. I had ran into a guy that, you know, was in the same bike as me. And we just, you know, quickly had a conversation. And um, at the time we had, you know, rode in a group. It was myself, uh, this, this other gentleman who was in the bike, the same, and then one of his friends who was, you know, on a regular bike. And as we were leaving, he said, do you know who you were just riding with? 
And uh, I remember I said, no, I mean, he just told me his name was Dave. And you know, that's really all <laughs> I thought. And he said, you know, go home and Google David Bailey. I was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go home. And I went and Googled David Bailey. And uh, he was this, you know, world champion motocross racer through the through the 90s. And, you know, then had a then had this, you know, terrible accident. Um, you know, on a motorbike, broke his back, was in a similar situation to me, uh, was paralyzed from the, you know, chest down and, you know, let sport, you know, truly allow him to excel again in life. And then, you know, went on to become this, you know, multi Ironman world champion. Wow. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the guy that, you know, I need to be with. He's going to be a a mentor of mine, a great friend. He's going to be able to show me that, you know, there truly is life after this accident. Um, so, you know, started to ride the bike with David, you know, for the next, you know, few months and was getting stronger and stronger, but, you know, always had challenges of just keeping up with them. I thought it'd be impossible to ever get that strong and, you know, relatively pretty quickly. I remember an early conversation he had with me of just saying, you know, I see a lot of potential in you. Um, you know, if you just continue at this, you know, you'll be, you know, at an elite level relatively soon. And, you know, I was always so grateful for, for David for, you know, pushing me and then, you know, just, you know, staying with me, I think early on, whenever I needed a mentor, someone that was in a similar situation to me and, um, you know, just relatively pretty quickly after there, I was not only, you know, riding with David, but then pushing David to, you know, keep up with me and, you know, had, had then pushed me to, (laughs) you know, really look at, you know, the, really look at the Paralympics, look at elites, um, you know, elite athletics and, it was right at this time in 2016 when uh, Team USA had just finished up Rio and they were looking for that next you know, set of athletes to come in to, to train up for Tokyo in 2020 uh, because a lot of their athletes had retired at that time. So looking for that next generation of athletes. And you know, I saw this posting that they had, they were looking for you know, a developmental team early on to come in, live and train at the um, you know, Colorado Springs Olympic Training Center and, um, you know, become an athlete, you know, training up for the Tokyo 2020 games. And, you know, I remember just applying and saying, okay, there's, there's no way they're going to go and pick me. I mean, I did a few marathons here and there, but have no race experience. They have no idea who I am, but we're writing on a business case, you know, really from like a professional standpoint of being like, you know, I work a full time. Oh my gosh. Now, ROI you know, I for Brandon Lyons. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Pretty much. It was nothing sports related other than like early on athletic, you know, achievements and really just that if you give me a chance, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to prove you wrong. And I remember getting a, getting an email relatively soon after saying, you know, we'd like you to come out for a one-on-one, uh, you know, individual tryout for, for two weeks at the Olympic training center in March, 2017. And I was just floored that they would even give me the opportunity. And I knew that I wasn't going to let that opportunity go. So I had a few months to train up got faster, got a little bit stronger and went out to the training center in March, spent two weeks there and and we're going through power tests and, you know, learning what it takes to be an Olympic athlete, being surrounded by, you know, Olympians, Paralympians, you know, all around you, those two weeks, it's hard not to be inspired and not to be motivated. Right. So I remember showing up early every single day, you know, putting in extra work and just wanting this opportunity. And I was fortunate enough that they saw, you know, enough. I think they saw potential that, you know, if you gave this guy an opportunity for four years, um, you know, let's see what he can do. So I moved And the, the interesting part about my whole story, how everything kind of comes full circle is in May um, of, of 2017. So exactly to the date, May 24th, 2017 was the first day that I moved in to become a resident athlete at the Olympic training center in Colorado Springs. So three years to the date of my injury, um, you know, there was this again pivotal moment in my life that I'm now a now a full time resident athlete, and you know was able to be the first uh, full time hand cyclist ever to live at the Colorado Springs Olympic Training Center. So, uh, for those that aren't aware of the training center, this the same place where you know the likes of Michael Phelps or you know Katie Ledecky would train you know year round leading up to the games. Wow, what is it like being around all these? I mean, these are the from when we're talking physical uh, form, the highest of the highest, the best of the best, I'm sure it's inspiring, but talk about imposter syndrome. I mean, like, I can't imagine. Did you feel that at all?
Hmm. <laughs> totally. Mhm. Mm Wow. It's just, it's an incredible story. I know you know that, but it's so cool to hear it through and just all the different steps and twists and turns that it takes to kind of land you where you are now. Obviously, I, I want to quickly highlight you running into David, right? Talk about a serendipitous moment. You happen to be at the same spot on the beach as this guy at the same day. And it's like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm being pessimistic, but... I think with COVID and all this stuff that's been going on the last few years, people are losing a little bit of hope and, and faith and fate and, and all that. And everyone's just like down on themselves. That reassures me that things will work out. Opportunities and people and experiences will come into your life at the right times when you need them most and help push you in a different direction that you never saw possible. So I thought that was amazing when, when you did meet David and really thanks to him and Thanks to family and friends fundraising, that kind of all fell into place for you. But I want to talk now, Brandon, a little bit about your mindset. And Parker and I, we call it mental fortitude. For you, I think it's really resiliency and how you use resiliency to not just overcome your injury, but to your recent point, be a Olympic training athlete while having full and part-time jobs. I can barely have a full-time job with nothing, let alone do multiple things on top of that. So how was your resilient mindset used throughout those experiences?
Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> wow. I love that. And Brandon, we have a few more questions, but I think it, we have to ask you, like, what are some tangible things that you do during the course of the day to bring you back to your purpose, that bring you back to the reason why you do things? Do you keep a journal? Do you talk to specific people on a given day? Do you have a routine? Um, I'm curious, and I'm sure Elevation Nation is curious. What do your days look like? Wow. I heard your doorbell ring. If you need to grab the door, you're more than welcome to. You're good? Okay. I was going to say, Parker's a good editor, so we can cut that out. Awesome. Definitely going to edit that out. Then. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, Brandon, that's, that's incredible. I think you know finding your purpose is extremely important. Obviously, 
the flexibility at the firm. Shout out, Uncle Ernst. Thank you for that flexibility. It, it's it's remarkable, right? And a lot of stars needed to align to get you to where you are today. And a lot of st stars will continue to align to get you to wherever you're going to go in the future. And I think for Elevation Nation out there, as you guys are listening, it may feel as though your stars are not aligning right now. I think for a lot of young 20-something-year-old guys and girls, COVID has really put a weird curveball into the plan that you drew up, to your point, Brandon, when you mentioned that earlier. And life is going to give us curveballs and knuckleballs and sliders. But how we respond and how we're resilient to the challenges that life throws at us is when we really find our true character and our perspective power. So I love that. We have a section that we like to do here at Elevation Nation, Brandon. That's our rapid fire question. So we haven't prepped you on these. We got a few questions we want to ask you. So I'm going to kick it off with the first one. What is your favorite book of all time? Oh, my God. All right. This is going to turn from rapid to not rapid because Parker and I love this book. Go ahead. Damn. Mm-hmm. Takes a little perspective, and maybe it is picking up the subtle art of not giving a fuck in an airport and reading the whole thing on a flight in one day. But Mark Manson is a great dude. Uh, he's honestly got a great Twitter, too, if you're on Twitter, Brandon. All right, next one. You're up at 4.30 in the morning, cranking out a workout. What is the one song that you can just always go to that just gets you going? Fair enough. Oh, love that. <laughs> Great. That's awesome. Next one we got for you. It's the coolest place you've ever trained. sure you've been to many places and have incredible stories about each place but i mean i'm sure that was a really difficult question to pick out one in particular <laughs> Amazing. All right, last one. What is one thing that people don't know about you that would surprise Elevation Nation uh, that we already haven't mentioned? Even better.
Hmm. Legend. To be on the show. <laughs> oh my gosh. Those are two incredible fun facts. Those are pretty wow. good. So will there be a, another application submitted this year? Sworn to silence. Brandon Lyons, producers have him sign an NDA, so... Uh, don't worry. Ooh. We'll we'll get the inside scoop for Elevation Nation. You must be pretty good at the icebreaker thing, Brandon. I will have to <laughs> yeah, say. <right? laughs> That's awesome. Tell Bill Walton we want uh, him to call more games. That's what we need. I was going to say, my only relationship with Bill Walton is listening to him on uh, Pac-12, you know, on ESPN2, because <laughs> there's, you know, better games on Big Ten. Sorry, Bill. Sorry. <laughs> I love it. Brandon, this was incredible. I think... Obviously, your story has resonated with Parker and myself and all of Elevation Nation. So really, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us, just two normal, you know, younger EY guys that look up to people like you who have built a career, not only at the big four firm that we love, but also with a passion outside of it. Uh, it resonates with Parker and myself when we find people who are passionate about other things besides just work, as much as they are with work itself. Um, I think it's important to find that balance in life. So appreciate you sharing that with us. But it wouldn't be the Elevation Nation podcast without you sharing your mental motto with us. And we're really excited to hear it. So we'll get a little drum roll going. I know Parker's got some drum roll sound somewhere in his studio hits. But why don't you share that with us, Brandon? We're excited to hear it. It's all mindset game, right? It's all how you wake up and you approach it and you look at it. But Brandon, we've been going for an hour now. We told you 40 minutes, but uh, we had to buy 20 more minutes of your time tonight. Hopefully uh, the Amazon guy's not at the door anymore waiting for you to come pick up your package. But uh, I just want to say on behalf of Sam and myself, um, thank you. I mean, this conversation, I'll never forget. Honestly, it was... I mean, listening to your story um, is super inspiring, and uh, it brought me perspective. Um, and Elevation Nation, I hope it brought you perspective. So I'm very thankful and grateful that we were able to spend an hour with you. And hopefully this is just the start um, of a relationship, and we you know, will maybe one day watch you on TV in the Olympics um, or be there in person. Who knows? Or The Bachelor at. <laughs> Fair enough. 
I All right, Sammy. It. Beautiful Elevation Nation. Until next week. Peace. Yo.